Before we talk about plant nutrients, let's do a little recap on soil components. What makes up a soil? There's inorganic minerals, sand, silt, and clay, and other portions from weathered rock. There's organic matter, all those pieces of material that come from organisms that are, have died or decayed or also their droppings and excrement. There's soil organisms, the live things living in the soil, bacteria, fungi, algae, protozoa, and even larger things like earthworms, etc. Water and air. Let's look at a very simple nutrient cycle. All living things are made up of what is called organic matter and when they die that organic matter starts to decompose by the action of microorganisms freeing up the minerals that were in the bodies of those organisms and releasing them into the soil where those nutrients can be dissolved in water and uptaken by plant roots that absorb them and then the minerals that are absorbed are incorporated into the body of the plant and then when a, an animal eats that plant then they're incorporated into the animal's body the animal dies the whole process starts again here is a list of macronutrients, the nutrients that plants need in large amounts, and micronutrients. The macronutrients listed here um, at the top, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, are things that the plant gets pretty much on its own. It's not something we focus on in fertilizers. The plant can get carbon dioxide from the air, water from the soil, and oxygen from water and the atmosphere. The other ones are the ones that we do focus on as humans to give fertilizers to plants. Another way to categorize minerals uh, are, besides macro and micro are primary macronutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, NPK, and the secondary macronutrients, calcium, sulfur, and magnesium. And then sometimes silicon is also listed as a macronutrient. Micronutrients are listed there, boron, chlorine, manganese, iron, zinc, copper, molybdenum, nickel, selenium, and sodium. Again, as I said in a couple slides previous, that macronutrients are something the plants need in larger quantities. And they make up about 0.2 to 4% on a dry weight basis of the tissue of a plant. Whereas a micronutrient only makes up about 5 to 200 parts per million or less than 0.02% of the dry weight of the plant's biomass. Here's a list of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium macronutrients, the symbol used for them, their mobility within the plant, and their role in the plant. The mobility refers to the ability of the plant to move them around once they get inside the plant. For example, nitrogen is a mobile nutrient, meaning the plant can absorb it from the soil, put it into the, their tissues, but then if the plant becomes nitrogen deficient, there's no more coming in into the roots, the plant can move that nitrogen from where it was incorporated into the tissues of the plant, but um, break it free and move it to the parts that are growing. It's similar to like in a human um, woman who is pregnant, the body, um, the woman's, the mother's body will take nutrients out of the woman's body to give to the baby. So the nutrients go to the most critical place and in a plant that's the place of growth, the new leaves. So if a, a plant was nutrient deficient, meaning if the soil didn't have enough of a certain nutrient like nitrogen, the plant would take it from its older leaves, the nitrogen that was already there, those leaves that grew earlier when there was nitrogen, and it would move the nitrogen from the old leaves to the new leaves. So what you would see as the plant caregiver is you would see yellowing older leaves and know that's probably a nitrogen deficiency because yellowing um, of the leaves is an indication of nitrogen deficiency and yellowing of older leaves is, is specifically nitrogen. If the particular macronutrient was not mobile, then it wouldn't have been nitrogen. You'd see yellowing of the younger leaves instead. Similar list of the secondary macronutrients, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And you see that magnesium is mobile, but calcium and sulfur are not. So calcium deficiency would not show up as yellowing 
or discoloring in the older leaves, but you would see it in the newer leaves. And two slides on the micronutrients showing you again their symbol, mobility, and specific roles within the plant. Hopefully what I told you in the previous slide, you'll be able to answer this question at the bottom. Give it a try. Here is showing you a plant on the left with an immobile nutrient where the new leaves of these beans or alfalfa are yellowing because the nutrients can't be moved from the older leaves that were produced earlier to the newer leaves after the, this particular nutrient becomes deficient. It looks like it could be a calcium deficiency. It could be a micronutrient also that is not mobile. On the right, you're seeing corn, which is nitrogen deficient, and the older leaves are turning yellow as the plant takes from the older leaves and moves it to the growing tips higher up and starts to make the older leaves yellow and brown. These are also, uh, these corn plants are also entering into kind of their senescence. They're getting old and mature and they're starting to die, but the plants still will go through that process of moving no mobile nutrients like nitrogen to the growing tips. So I, I know a few of those last slides showed a, uh, these little charts of nutrients and their role. And those are kind of more specific um, roles an easy way to remember the function of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is this, NPK, up, down, all around. The nitrogen is responsible for the above ground vegetative growth. Phosphorus induces and encourages root growth and potassium all around growth and vigor of the plant. In addition to phosphorus um, promoting and supporting root growth, the down part, it also promotes flower and fruit production. So up, down, all around for the functions of NPK. pH is also really important. If the pH is off, even though the nutrients are in the soil, they become bound up at higher and lower pHs. So the, the plant can't get the nutrients. They're not released into the soil from the soil particles. And it's as if those nutrients aren't there. Of course, fertilizers can add the nutrients to a nutrient poor soil and it's careful to not leach the soils, uh, water them so much that all the nutrients wash away because in general a good healthy soil will provide most of the nutrients for the plant. You don't have to add too much more if you keep it really high in organic matter and a healthy soil ecology, good microbes. There are two systems of pipes in a plant. There's the phloem that moves the dissolved sugars around and there's the xylem different set of pipes that moves the water around that has the dissolved minerals or nutrients in it. So the xylem is the way that all these nutrients are getting into the plant through the roots and up into the different various areas of the plant. It moves up through the plant by this passive um, process called um, tension cohesion or transpiration. So it's just like you sucking up water or liquid off the top of a straw creates a suction that pulls in water in the bottom of the straw. The xylem is like that too. It's an unbroken pipe from the, the tops of the plant on the leaves all the way down into the roots. So and what, um, when water is evaporating out from inside of the plant, out of the xylem, there are little pores on the leaves called stomata where the xylem meets the atmosphere and the water can evaporate out from the inside of the plant to the atmosphere. That release of water molecules through evaporation through the stomata ca causes a pressure gradient, kind of like a suction, that sucks in more water from the roots. So it's that tension and the fact that each water molecule, they're all stuck to each other. That's the cohesiveness of water. It's, it's um, propensity to stick to itself, creates this unbroken column of water from the leaves all the way down to the roots, just like in your straw, the water or the liquid comes up through your straw because you suck the top off and it's all connected to each other and it pulls it up from the bottom. That's how the nutrients get inside the plant. So now that you know how the nutrients move around, you know what they are and what they do in a plant, let's look more about the application of this to irrigation systems. We are managing plants to perform how we want them to, to be healthy and vigorous and strong. 
either to look good or to serve some other kind of human function. Imagine a turf field. We want the grass to be strong and vigorous and healthy so it performs, for example, as a soccer field. Or in an orchard, we want the plants to produce a lot. Or in a landscape, we want it to look good. Our business is aesthetics and production. Plants need just enough water, not too much. If there's too much, the roots will suffocate. They all, the roots also need oxygen to perform the process called cellular respiration, just like we do. We, we breathe in oxygen to help do this process called cellular respiration, and we breathe out CO2. The roots need some of that. They can't exist in a soil that's too water bogged, or they will rot and suffocate. But they also, the roots can't grow in too dry of a soil. It has to be just right in the middle, kind of like that Goldilocks syndrome. Not too much, not too little, just right. And it gets just the right amount of water. Plants can use that water for photosynthesis to grow and produce. And the water is absorbed through small extensions of root cells called root hairs through a, the process of osmosis. Transpiration is the evaporation of water from inside the plant, from the xylem, coming up from the roots, up to the stomata, the pores and the leaves, and evaporating out of the stomata into the atmosphere. That's the loss of water from the inside of the plant to the outside, to the atmosphere. Evaporation is water leaving the surface of everywhere else that you can think of in a particular landscape, from the surface of the soil, from the surface of the plant, not from the inside of the plant, just from the outer droplets on the outside of the plant, from buildings, structures, that's evaporation. Combine both when you think about your site, <clears throat> and that's evapotranspiration. And you, as an irrigation person, the one taking care of the plants, you need to be providing, replacing the water to that landscape that was lost by evapotranspiration. How do you know if your plants are not getting the right amount of water? They'll be wilting, they'll be dull in appearance, kind of grayish, um, and the older leaves might look like they're about to die or falling off. Water stress, you'll see that happen during a period of really high heat or very low humidity and a really dry, hot wind like a sundowner event or intense sunlight or maybe a gopher ate its roots or some other kind of mechanical injury or your weed eater, you know, busted the bark somehow and scarred it. Those, that can happen too and cause water stress. And all of those equate to the plant's performance or growth and vigor being reduced. Again, how do you know how much to irrigate? The plants can tell you, but you can also measure soil moisture with devices um, or feeling it and always dig down a few inches to see if the water that came from rain or from your irrigation system really infiltrates deeply down to the roots or not. Don't just scratch the surface. You can also use the evapotranspirative or ET rate and figure out what it is. Um, you can get that information from weather stations locally and adjust your amount of your irrigating for the climate as the climate changes through seasons and through days. Again, I'll reiterate it a few times. When we irrigate, um, us humans taking care of plants, we were replacing the water that has been lost by evapotranspiration. Enough water should be applied to encourage deep rooting, deep irrigation, so you want the water on long enough so that infiltrates down um, you know, quite a ways, and also reduce, you don't want to give so much water, you know, you, you don't want to do deep irrigation every day, or that'll keep the soil wet all the time, and that would cause some root rot to happen. So deep irrigation, infrequent, but deep. That's the best way to do most perennials. The soil should dry out between applications. It's good for the plants, and it, it you know, reduces rotting happening, but it also helps the soil structure be maintained. If you just do a lot of shallow, quick, short, little and, and uh, irrigations like on lawns, you know, 15 minutes, three or four times a week, you're going to encourage shallow rooting in your plants. That's not so bad for a lawn, but it can be a problem for trees that live in that lawn. Another um, factor is the evenness, how evenly your irrigation system is distributing that water. That's something you also have to think about when you're making an irrigation system. 
here's kind of the worst case scenario of trees that have been irrigated by a, um, an irrigation system that is set for the lawn so it's it's very um, it comes on often and it doesn't stay on very long so the water ne never infiltrates very deeply and the grass roots are happy because they're not that deep but the tree then realizes it can only get water if it has shallow roots so it sacrifices deep roots for shallow roots and when you have a windstorm come along these shallow rooted trees that are surrounded by lawn and irrigated on a lawn's watering regime are not stable and they fall over all right at the risk of continuing to state the obvious one plants need water not too much not too little two water flows to your house garden or job site by some kind of pressure either the city is pumping it up to give it pressure or it's gravity pressure your water source is above you or um, excuse me three amount of water your plants get depends on the sprinkler or emitter so those where the water comes out of your irrigation system to the soil that's really important to know the rate and the flow that comes out of that sprinkler to know how much your plants are actually receiving each sprinkler and emitter has pressure requirements so you need to know something about pressure in your system some of the underground apparatus that you use to deliver water to your plants the underground portion is usually PVC or polyvinyl chloride like a type of plastic material these these types the PVC pipes that are um, meant to be underground can take you know the pressure of ground over them they are sun sensitive so they should not be exposed to the sun or they become brittle and break easily so you're seeing some of the piping and the fittings below these days in south southwestern united states southern california often will have drip systems and the pvc is underground and it comes up to this black poly pipe flexible pipe um, polyethylene pipe that is used for the drip systems that runs along the top of the ground and delivers the water in small amounts in exact locations right at the base of a plant this picture at the bottom is um, a no-no you don't use pvc underground it's um, pretty soft and with the pressure of the soil on top of it it will flatten and you'll get some problems so just an example of some of the fittings and um, the poly pipe itself it's, it's called a polyethylene pipe but also called poly pipe some typical emitters drip systems um, they're still called drip although you can see the bottom picture not all emitters where the water comes out are called uh, excuse me are dripping anymore the first drip systems were were truly like the picture in the upper left where the water is delivered right to the plant and water would drip out at slow rates and you'd leave this on for a long time maybe like an hour and it would slowly saturate the soil and you get a, um, it really reduces evaporation and reduces um, wasting water spraying in between the plants it goes right to the, where you want it to now we've got all kinds of different emitters in drip systems like the bottom one these micro sprayers so they're not all still dripping but we still you know usually call them all drip systems a great technique for drier climates for reducing your water use by you know at least 30 to 40 percent some other little micro sprayers the red one on the right that you'll see a lot, uh, often in like avocado orchards and then on the left is what's called a shrubler it sends out a small umbrella of droplets again um, they are bigger droplets usually and that that means there's less misting less loss of water to evaporation so back to the pressure that you need to know about in your irrigation system you do need to know how much pressure there is in there to make sure those emitters are functioning properly you have to know a little bit about basic hydraulics and do some calculations to make sure all the emitters or sprinklers are getting the water delivered to them at the right pressure so that the emitters function properly because if you don't have the right amount of pressure the emitters which are set to function in certain pressure ranges they will not function right and your plant won't get the water that you think it's getting and you'll have, start to see some problems
There's two types of water pressure, static, and that's the water when it's at rest and not moving. Picture your kitchen sink, you have not turned it on. There's water pressure in the pipe, but it's not moving because you don't have the valve open, you haven't turned it on. Once you open it, there's water pressure in the water uh, also, but that's dynamic water pressure, and they're not quite the same. Water is usually delivered to your home under pressure from the city or either by gravity or pump. A lot of it's by gravity here in Santa Barbara. Um, and you know, it's about, oh, I don't know, 90 PSI, sometimes a little lower, depends where you live and depends what else is going on, but there's a static and a dynamic water pressure. You can measure the static water pressure and the dynamic water pressure with a small um, pressure gauge. They can go be screwed right on to where your hose would go. And there, there's a setting, a little um, valve. You can close close on the pressure gauge, then turn the, um, turn the water on, open, and you can see what the pressure is, the static water pressure is. And then the little, um, little valve, you open it up and the water shoots through the valve and you can get the dynamic water pressure. So now I want to take you through an example um, of calculating water pressure for a very um, simplified irrigation system. In this example, it's just made up to give you an idea of what we're talking about when we say doing calculations of water pressure. In this example, um, you've got the main line, which is a bigger PVC pipe, usually running down the center of um, your street and then coming to, um, branching off and coming to your property and then usually um, you'll have a valve that you put in or your, you know, your gardener put in or someone that, where you can turn that water on and off. I mean, some of that water goes into your house, but the, the, we're talking about the part that goes to your landscaping. In this very simple made up example, we've got the main line coming in to your property. You've got one valve and then after the valve, that valve um, manages the two sprinkler heads that come after it that water your lawn. And we're, um, I'm making this up, but it's not based on nothing. It's somewhat realistic. The water pressure is coming to your house at 43 PSI. So pounds per square inch is how they measure water pressure. In this example, there's a 20 foot drop from the main line where your road is. Imagine your house, you drive up the road to your house and then your driveway goes down from the road to where your house is. There's a 20 foot drop from the road, the main line valve, the main line to the valve and um, because there's a 20 foot drop, water pressure will be higher down at the bottom than at the top. Just like when you go down in a pool, your ears can start to hurt because there's more and more pressure, water on top of you. The same is true for an irrigation system. As the lines go downhill, pressure in the pipe increases. As the pipes go uphill, pressure decreases. Here's what a very typical landscape valve looks like water coming in from the left, moving through that little um, cylindrical black thing on top with the wires coming out is the solenoid, which electrically can turn on and off or open and close this valve. And it goes through the regulator um, in the middle there and then comes out to the right, which will go to the PVC and the poly pipe that delivers water right to where you want it to go. Here's a little visual of this made up system. So you, you've got the road with the water coming from the city and there's the main line up on the road where it says main line and it's being delivered to your property at 40, 43 PSI. Well, you put an irrigation system in to, for your little lawn in front of your house and the line comes from that main line all the way down to the valve at the bottom there. So it goes down 20 feet in um, elevation. So the PSI or the the pressure is going to be higher at the valve, higher than 43 because it went downhill and that created more pressure inside the pipe in the water. And you're trying to figure out, well, okay, how much pressure is going to be in the water when it gets to my sprinklers? I know what the sprinklers need to function properly, but I'm not sure yet what the pressure is. So I have to figure that out. Part of figuring out or calculating that pressure is you have to also take into account the loss of pressure as water flows through the pipe due to frictional losses. 
in the inside of the pipe is not absolutely smooth. There's roughness in there. So as water travels through that, it slows down due to the friction. Now it takes long stretches of pipe to really significantly reduce the pressure due to frictional losses, but it can be significant if you're dealing with larger irrigation systems. Think like an apartment complex or you know, golf course or a really big ranch or orchard. Also, there's loss of pressure as water th flows through the valves. You saw that valve, the black valve, the water kind of slow, slows down and swirls around inside of there. It's not, a, it's not just a tube um, and it will slow down and lose pressure due to that. And then again, elevation changes can affect the water pressure. So all those things have to be taken into account. This is the type of chart that's published often by irrigation supply companies that can help you figure out frictional losses. I won't go into the details, but you can figure out per hundred feet of pipe and a certain diameter of pipe and a certain um, flow rate, you can figure out how many PSIs will be lost due to frictional losses. Okay, so here's pretty much the whole shebang of this small example hypothetical irrigation system. You've got your main line where water is delivered to the site at 43 PSI, then it goes down 20 feet. That 20 feet will increase the PSI by 8.66 pounds per square inch. So why? Because for every foot that your irrigation system goes, goes down, it will increase the PSI by 0.433. PSI for every foot that your irrigation system go, goes up, it increases by 0.433. So at the, very, at the very bottom here, you've got that string of gray boxes. Look on the far left, your mainline um, irrigation pressure is delivered to your property at 43 PSI. It is going to lose about 1.5 PSI by frictional losses in that 100 foot stretch of pipe as it goes down the 20 feet. So just by moving through the pipe, it slows it down a little bit, 1.5 PSI. But it, then it gains 8.66 PSI from because the elevation has dropped. And so it's increasing pressure by going downhill. And so you end up with 51.66 PSI. Now we're subtracting 1. More, 1.5 more PSI because going through the valve reduces the pressure. Then from the valve to the first blue irrigation emitter, it loses another 0.75 PSI from frictional loss um, and, and and then between the, the first and second emitter it loses another 0.75 PSI. So at the very end the final pressure at the last head is 43.66 PSI and is that enough? Well when you bought these emitters or when you set up the system you've got these sprinkler heads that said right on them or on the box these function at 30 to 45 psi so you you know kind of say whoo good my pressure is 43 it's right in that range these will work properly and the plants will get the amount of water that i want them to because i know they're functioning in the way that i want them to so that's a very simple way of determining um, whether the pressure is correct the good news is next most smaller residential and commercial irrigation systems are not large enough to significantly compromise your water pressure or cost. So you don't need to worry about it too much. If you have very insignificant um, hills, then the pressure is not gonna go up and down enough to matter too much. So you're set.